Welcome to Video Mojo, our courageous exploration of the new frontiers of digital, online, and social video. And today, my guest is Tony Naj, a really talented, amazing, multifaceted comedian, uh, a comedian who uses her full body to express herself, who's amassed hundreds of thousands of followers on TikTok, and who is dedicated to making a difference by being authentic, by exploring her authentic voice, and by talking about important issues. So please check out this episode of Video Mojo with comedian Tony Naj. Welcome, Tony Naj, to Video Mojo. I am so grateful that you took the time to hang out with us and have some fun. Yeah, I'm super happy to be here. You embody for me a lot of what I mean by Video Mojo. I also use the term video chutzpah, which is mm. a Yiddish term. But, you know, you have courage and you t are adventurous and um, risk-taking. Right off the bat, is there something about video and what you do that sparks creative energy? Well, I think the thing about video in the postmodern world that has become really complicated is though even though we're broadcasting ourselves compulsively and documenting our lives in this really you know intense manner like i if you could i have a friend who has a child and she's probably taken 7000 pictures of her child in the first year and i think i have you know like 20 pictures of my childhood. So we as a society are so ingrained at this point in self-documentation as if we wouldn't exist if we weren't documenting it. And the thing to me that's really interesting about video and broadcasting myself, which is what I do, I actually don't take pictures very often or do anything with media if I'm not going to broadcast it is because I am kind of searching for a certain authenticity that I can only really achieve with an audience in mind. You know, otherwise I like to take pictures of nature or other, every once in a while I'll take pictures of my child just so she has some when she's older. But I, I don't know, I really like to explore how to be your true self within this avenue and within these platforms of documentation and for me personally part of being my true self is the objective of sharing that <laughs> which is kind of bonkers retrospectively thinking about it when i say that out loud i i don't think it's bonkers at all i think cool. I, I think that there's an aspect of community and certainly as a performer you you feed off the audience when you're in front of a live audience so i think that you know, as a filmmaker, as well as a comedian, you have this projection that you can make, which I often have to teach people, which is that like, like I'm looking at what we used to call the glass ball when with traditional camera, I'm actually using my iPhone camera. So I'm looking at the camera lens on my iPhone and yes. knowing <laughs> that I'm talking to you and talking yes. to the audience. So you what you're talking about is you made that leap that you're not alone. And by bouncing your ideas off of other people, there's a synergy that moves things along. So that's not bonkers. That makes sense to me. Yeah, I, I love thinking about art as a collaborative co-creation. And so, you know, when I'm making something purely for myself, which plenty of people do, you know, I, I am very aware of that. Lots of people just take pictures to have for, them, for themselves. And that's reasonable. But I think for me personally, I love the collaborative co-creation that comes with working with or for others. You know, I think a lot of what I do, it's partly for myself because it gives my own personal meaningless existence the illusion of meaning. You know, so it's like if I view my life as content and I view the things that I think and say as something that's perhaps worthy of sharing, then that creates this illusion of meaning that keeps me going and pulls me out of the nihilistic tornado that I always find myself in. So that's part of my motivation. But I also think, you know, there is this way in which when I am making a video for someone else, or if I'm teaching a class with someone else, right, when I'm teaching a class, I believe those people are contributing 
to the creative process, whether or not they are conscious of it, their energy is part of my creative output, right? So if I'm teaching a class, I used to come to class prepared and I would have a dance and I would be like, learn this dance that I figured out on my own earlier. But I stopped doing that a couple years ago because I did feel the quantum entanglement of working in a room with people. And in a way, I thought we were all collectively creating the dance, even though I was the only one speaking and doing things and telling everybody what to do. And I almost think the same thing can happen with a video, even if I prepare the video beforehand or I write it down. When I go into the filming process, the future people who are going to participate in watching the video are participating in my creative process and making the video for them. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, there's so many things in there going all the way back to, you know, discovering your own authentic self through the process of creating. I think that's one of the reasons that it's worth doing social video. And so I, I wanted to come to, you know, you're on YouTube, you're on Facebook, you're on Instagram, you're on TikTok. Right. Mm -hmm. And you're also a filmmaker and a dance teacher. And, you know, it's like there's this multidisciplinary creator. But just looking at this video dynamic that we're talking about here on Video Mojo, and it's not about the numbers, but I'm going to play with the numbers just because I think they're a reference. And I like your term gyration nation you use on, on YouTube. But there's two 2000 subscribers, a little more than that on to your YouTube channel. There are about 5000 followers to your Facebook page. Instagram, you've got 93,000 followers and TikTok, you have 320,000 followers. Now, that makes yeah, you and on my what? my Facebook um, profile, it's the five thousand, but it's forty four thousand on my fan page. On your fan page, uh, yeah, oh, I, I have see. a okay. fan page. Well, then, yeah, okay, very good, and and it's T O N I N A G Y Tony Naj, just for for those of you that want to look her up and and find her on the socials. But, you know, to me, going back to this thing that we're talking about of the collaboration, one of the things that I think a lot of people don't get, and I'm interested in your experience of it, is that there is more of a collaborative energy on TikTok, to at least my experience, that there's more feedback, there's more of this dynamic, even compared to Instagram Reels. Is that is that your experience or not? I think each platform is completely unique and each video has its own life within each platform and it interacts with people in a very different way. And um, so Facebook, I have my personal page, I have my fan page, and even those are different. So it's like you create these ecosystems within your social media platforms and they are going to participate with you in a unique form because when I go to Facebook, I'm coming at Facebook with a different projection than when I'm coming to TikTok versus when I'm coming to Instagram. So the consumer, the user of the platform already has their preconceived notions that they are bringing to your content and they're bringing to your um, relationship, right? So in Instagram, that is where people actually hit me up in my DMs the most. And that's where people are connecting to me privately the most. So that I have like a whole Instagram world where I have Instagram friends who are taking the time to be DMing me and wanting to connect on a personal level. That doesn't happen in TikTok at all. It's right. the very DM, the rare DM culture is not even... nearly as accessible. Right. No, because you have to be following each other. So TikTok to me feels less about direct community building and it's more about the collective consciousness and everybody's take on a trend of which I don't necessarily participate in either because I don't really, I haven't, I don't think I've made any trend videos, but with TikTok, so, so you're talking about the more, by trend mini by trend videos, you mean meme videos, right? That you, yeah. know, you take somebody else's audio and do the thing. Yeah. 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 I've never done that. The only thing I've done is I've made fun of some trends, <laughs> but I've never <laughs> participated in the trend, but I do have this vibrant existence on TikTok, and I enjoy TikTok a lot. I think the TikTok algorithm is much more sophisticated in the sense of it's driving the content you directly 
are going to have a hard time extracting yourself from. I think the TikTok algorithm is much more intelligent in keeping you on the platform. Facebook, I think, has become this place of almost social rebellion and self-loathing and um, combativeness that there can be this potential on Facebook. I will maybe have the most experience with trolls on Facebook, but it's really, I haven't really had too many bad ones. But I think that people are reimagining their relationship to Facebook a little bit, the ride or dies that just haven't given up. And um, I think that is a different kind of community than the other two, for sure. So, so are you posting different content on every platform? I, I, I have no. a feeling like I see the same Instagram it's reels. You're same. not. You're just noticing it's that the, the responses are different. Very. They so are you're not customizing different. your content to the context, which I, which I think is what Va Gary Vaynerchuk says people should do. You know, certainly respect the culture of every platform. And he's a monster content creator. Most of us mere mortals don't have the capability to do a different video for each platform. It's YouTube that I think is really the outlier. Be there, I think YouTube has its own ecosystem and stratosphere of which I do believe needs its own respect. And I've gone in and out of YouTube over the years, in and out. And I am not as committed to YouTube as I am to the other platforms. Yeah. And so let's stay with those. And if we put Instagram DMs aside and the fact that that interactivity goes on there, which I totally hear you about that. But just on the video point of view, how do you see the difference between uh, posting video on Instagram versus posting it on TikTok, given that you're putting the same stuff up there? Well, I think the culture of Instagram has a bit more of a connection to projecting the life that you are curating in this specific way that makes you look good. And I think with TikTok, there was that happening for a while. And you would see these TikToks of these, you know, these massive families of blonde children, and they would all you know, be doing the same little dance and they would have, you know, 20 million followers. But I think that TikTok then started to get into this whole vulnerability, exposing oneself, exploring um, imperfections, anything that was too polished or too produced kind of wasn't as thriving in a certain TikTok algorithm. I think the TikTok algorithm, the way that it's built, you could have an algorithm just of people fighting. You could have an algorithm just of people you know, showing off their super wealthy homes and you can be in a neurodivergent algorithm or an ADHD algorithm. So I think the space that's been created within the TikTok world is less purely about presenting your perfect existence. It's also less about connecting to people you already know. Where Instagram, you are probably Instagram friends with everyone you know. And then there might be this crossover with strangers. TikTok is mostly about strangers, less about like- that's, And that's, that's what I love about it is because I can reach people that I don't know and that have never seen me before. But if they somehow resonate with what I'm doing, uh, they can follow me and there can be an ongoing connection in some form. You do comedy, but it's not frivolous comedy. I, there's meaning. And part of that is, this is my observation, correct me if I'm wrong, that you're digging for your authentic voice. You're digging to express things that are going on in your head. And, um, you know, that's got to be one of the toughest creative challenges that I can think of to be funny and be meaningful at the same time. Do you mm, find it easy yes, or harder? Definitely. Is that a big challenge for you? <laughs> um, I think that for me personally, that's always been a driving force in my uh, artistic pursuits ever since I began them. I also think this concept of an authentic voice, obviously it's something that you will be seeking and exploring for one's entire existence. I in no way claim that I'm like, I've found my authentic voice and I'm done. Yeah, it's a process. But I think something that I discovered 
in my 20s was I was living in New York City. This will all circle back. And in New York City, there was this culture of clubs, right? And when you would go to a club, there would be the exclusive clubs and the VIP clubs. And there would be a velvet rope and a doorman with a list. And he would basically judge your appearance and whether or not you're worthy to step into this um, place of worship, right? So I was living in New York City. I was a you know a bit of a wild child. I like to go out and dance. I was I love to go out dancing and I had an ego. So I was like, well, I want to go to the hot clubs because I have an ego and I want to be, I'm in the greatest city in the world. I want to be where the action's happening, you know, and where the good drugs are and the beautiful people. But the thing that I noticed, if I were to be honest with myself, I'm like, okay, I'm a cute girl. I'm tall. I'm skinny, but I'm not a model. I'm not like, and I don't have the clothes of these models. I don't have the hair where they get the hair done and the nails and the all this. I was like, I don't, I can't do that. I just, that's not my style, but I want to be with these beautiful models, but like, I can't do all the things that these beautiful models are doing to get into this club. So then I was like, oh, well, I'm a skateboarder. I'm dirty. You know, I have a different vibe, which is I'm authentically New York. And so you don't want to go to a club where there isn't some like kid that looks like they're a New Yorker, you know, or they have that vibe that that's bringing something to the table that feels like, quote unquote, authentic. So I just decided I'm going to bring my skateboard around. I'm going to wear my sneakers. I'm going to wear whatever I want to wear. I'm going to be dirty and I'm going to be your authentic New York experience. And that was how I got to go to all these hot clubs in New York. And it wasn't because I was the hottest chick there. It was because I was presenting a personality and that personality had value. And I think that the same thing kind of became clear to me with video work you know i used to just make pure sketch comedy i love sketch comedy i'm obsessed with sketch comedy it's one of my major joys in life but eventually as the platform started shifting and i wanted to you know continue with my work and keep propelling myself in a direction that felt forward a lot of what i was realizing was like okay a lot of people do sketch comedy you know am i the best comedian on the planet doing sketch comedy probably not (laughs) i'm gonna actually guarantee i'm not do i have the best production equipment no because i'm one person do i have the best editing no because i'm one person editing all my content i'm doing everything myself so what do i have that no one else has is me That's that's the only thing i had So that was kind of why I started exploring putting me out into the world because it was the only thing I could do that nobody else could do better than me. (laughs) Even if me is whatever, no one could do me better than me. That was kind of my logic. Yeah. And that's a great logic. I mean, and you've, so you got a very early lesson in authenticity that you've managed to continue to ride. Where, where do you see it going? I mean, do you have, I'm curious about your goals as far as I can tell. And again, correct me if I'm wrong. You're not taking sponsorship, even though you're at a following level on TikTok where I imagine you get asked. And I do, yeah. You're not selling products that I see. So wh- where, no. how do you see it going? And do you look at it as a business? Are you trying to grow a business? Are you just building a career or what? Okay, so as I mentioned to you before the interview, I happen to be a Capricorn, and I am obsessed with work and my career. Like, if I read my horoscope, first, it's like a spiritual hippie. If I read my horoscope, and it's about, like, love or family or, like, spirituality, I'm like, well, this week is a fucking waste. Like, I throw out the paper. (laughs) If my horoscope (laughs) is not talking about my career or my work, I'm not interested. And even though, like, I do have this, like, super intense spiritual practice and identity and devotion. Um, And I have a daughter, you know, I'm always like my baby, my career. And my daughter's like, thanks. Uh, So (laughs) yes, I do have a deep ambition. And my ambition is I've written a TV pilot. I've written a book. I've written many scripts. I really want to get my TV show produced. I really want to direct films. 
and I want to continue to write books. But like I'm at this precipice of trying to sell myself to the people that are like, oh, here's some money to do this. You know, I guess I could self-publish my book or I could just keep making things and putting them out for free. But I'm hoping that I can I'm building enough of an audience where um, the right people will say, hey, I think you have value. Let's, you know, create these products in a way where you're not self-funding everything and doing everything yourself, which would be like my ultimate dream. Yeah, I think I, 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 I can see that happening, you know, given the talent that I see in your content and your determination, <laughs> which yeah, you spoke to obviously very directly. <laughs> so the the kind of end of the day, I think, is making a difference. And, you know, and I do I did ask you on and I do relate to your work because there is a spirituality and there is an environmental awareness and I could go down the list. I mean, it's very conscious kind of humor. In fact, I wanted to bring in, I, I told you that I like your, you call your production company cave light productions. And on your website, it says that it's an independent media company founded by Tony Naj that is quasi radical, semi spiritual, pseudo philosophical, <laughs> somewhat as essential and mostly funny, meaning come watch funny videos here. <laughs> which I thought was, was a really great piece of writing. I'm not just trying to compliment you, but it's like the the making of a difference that has to do with take out all the quasi semi pseudos, you know, but actually communicating progressive thought, if you will, to try and put it in one phrase and and spiritually transformational awareness, whatever, you know, ultimately, is that what drives you? I, you know, the George Carlin comes to mind for me because he's somebody that I think was both very funny and also spoke profound truths. Oh, he's such a hero of mine as well. Um, absolutely. I think one of the things that drives me the most is beyond my own ego and my own personal ambitions and desires. I mean, this is why I don't take money when I'm offered it from corporations is because I, I really genuinely from like the depths of my soul am interested in being a part of a paradigm shift in whatever way and capacity that's possible. I do think that humanity is at this really interesting precipice of potential change and anything that I can do to contribute, participate, support, um, encourage that type of shifting into a more I, don't, I just want to say the word groovy, you know, groovy existence, not to be <laughs> a hippie about it. But I just think there's so much possibility <laughs> in what humans can be doing. And there is so much unnecessary suffering that is ubiquitous in culture. And so for me personally, I feel incredibly passionate about talking about these issues and being a part of whatever change I can be a part of. And I think that, I mean, George Carlin's an interesting example because when he was doing his comedy, I felt as if he was genuinely dropping a lot of knowledge on people and he was an education. You know, you if pre-internet, you listen to Carlin and you would learn things that you just uh, were not having access to in the traditional educational format. And he, he did a lot of really interesting research and he had an amazing mind of which to distill this information. I think now what's kind of interesting is the information is out there. You know, it is very much out there. And nothing I can say is educating people any more than they're already being educated in a certain sense. I mean, we have so much access to information. I think the thing that's facing us now is direct action. And so what to do with this education, how to apply this work, how to bring this into the body and not just leave it in the mind. Because I think our minds are quite aware. If I was like, hey, everybody, corporations are corrupt, you know, that wouldn't be <laughs> a revolutionary statement to make on stage. We would be like, yeah, I get it. Next. Um, so I think where I'm focusing and thinking and pontificating about in my own life and is how to bring together genuine community, personal and familial action. And, and 
I do think a lot of that is building personal and community empathy and compassion. And you know, it's like that, um, that Johnny Depp whole debacle that was going on and everyone was like having so many opinions about it. The thing that was really blowing my mind as a human is like, Oh yeah, we've all been this. We've all done this. We've done what she's done. I mean, I've never shot in someone's bed personally, but I was like sick idea, you know, like put it in the memory vault, but we've all behaved in these ways. And it was just disturbing how the people were acting as if this was something outside of themselves. They were like, Oh, well, here is this behavior that I can comment on as if I'm not participating in, if I don't have a partner that does this, if I'm not doing this myself, I haven't seen my parents behave in this way. I mean, we've all seen this. And so I guess my drive and my um, interest is in digging deep into the bowels of humanity and being like, let's face our own shit. Let's not throw shit at each other, you know? Let's actually examine our own feces and then realize that we all share feces. It's so important. And I, and I think actually, as I'm listening to you, I'm reflecting that I, uh, you know, it's the kind of thing that goes on with the TikTok algorithm, that I found you and your content on TikTok because I'm interested in content that makes a difference. I And I mm -hmm. like good production values and entertaining. And certainly I'm a big believer in having fun and being playful. And you're clearly having fun and being playful. But it's ultimately got this underlying thread of, I don't know, I'm gonna speak frankly, the world is fucked up. And, yeah. you know, we need to be addressing that. We can't be like dancing around the fact that we're not in trouble here as as a humanity and that there aren't people suffering that we could be helping. And, you know, I could keep going. Uh, I mean, anyway, it's so, so ironic congratulations that I'm like dancing you're... around yeah, and I'm go like, ahead. we can't be dancing around this <laughs> reality. And there I am <laughs> dancing around. But yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but you're dancing around in support of this message of yours, yeah. that, you know, whatever it is that you happen to be talking about at the moment. And, and, yeah. and the part of it that I, I clearly get to, which you said earlier, is that you're bringing what you're expressing into your body. And allowing mm. your body to be part of the expression, which a lot of people, even on TikTok, are just like, here's what I want to say, and I'm just saying it to the camera. You have the this extra instrument in your band, which is your own body, that you move so <laughs> freely and, uh, you know, in a way that I don't think I'm going to be doing anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, great. Well, it's so great to meet you. And, and I, and I do hope that there are executives from Netflix or Amazon Prime or you name it, HBO, whatever that, that can, uh, get attracted to your talent and hear about your pilots. And, uh, and so it's T-O-N-I, Naj is N-A-G-Y. And yes. on TikTok, it's Tony dot Naj. Uh, and you can Google or anything else you want people to know about to find you or, you know, your book or whatever. I'm hopefully the Google search will bring you into my interwebs and we will weave together in a collective dance of truth. Well, more to be revealed and I look forward to seeing where it all goes with you. Thanks again for making the time. Yes, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Video Mojo. Obviously, there are other episodes if you'd like more. I also want to let you know that I'm developing a new program called the Video Mojo Creativity Sandbox. And uh, it's going to have a pilot run in the next month or so, meaning October probably to here in 2022. Uh, if you'd like more information on that, please visit videocreator.me, which is where uh, my courses and content and that kind of stuff are. Subscribe to the email list if you want announcements. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.